Welcome to the Sloth Investor Podcast with your host, Mr. Sloth. Hi, this is the first episode of the Sloth Investor, an investing podcast in which you'll find out why I believe that the humble sloth is the best animal to characterize successful investing. Join me as I talk through my investing philosophy, my five bedrock principles, and I'd like to introduce you to my co-host coming all the way from Canada, Jay Prohaska. Jay, how are you today? I'm fantastic. Thanks for having me on your very first episode. I'm honored to be a guest here. My first ever podcast. Can you believe that it's come to this? So uh, a little background about the Sloth Investor. Um, Before you go that way. Go ahead. Actually, I've got a... I don't, I don't know if it's a UK versus a Canada thing, but I've noticed I pronounce it sloth. You pronounce it sloth. I'm thinking of that slow creature that you might see in some kind of nature show. Can you tell me a little bit more why you call it a sloth and I'm perhaps mispronouncing it? That is a great question. You know, for the longest time, I would also say sloth. And uh, it wasn't until I watched a nature documentary, gosh, must have been about five or six months ago, with David Attenborough. And of course, Mr. Attenborough, who was he visiting on this particular occasion? He was visiting a sloth. Now, again, why am I pronouncing the animal in that way? That's how David pronounced it. And if it's good enough for David, it's good enough for me. I bow down to my humble fellow Brit, David Attenborough. And um, I you know, dug a little bit deeper into that. And my best understanding is that that is how this animal is pronounced. And um, when I think about how do sloths move, they move obviously in a very slow like manner. And again, that gives you ca- some kind of insight into the pronunciation. But yeah, fascinating, fascinating to me and to you. Well, actually, now that you bring that up, it makes me think about sort of your investment principles, the, the sloth investor. Can you tell me a little bit more about how you came across or you came up with this name? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, Jay. Um, well, it's been quite a long process. So I'd say for the last five or six years, I've become a really voracious reader of investing books and journals. I listen regularly to podcasts and watch videos. It's become not even, I wouldn't say a hobby, more so of a passion, something I've been really, really um, intrigued and had this great desire to know more and more about. And the more and more I've read about investing, the more I've realized that really the investing world has got it wrong. When we're thinking about the bull and the bear, the two animals that most characterize, you know, most frequently characterize investing, I think that's wrong. For me, the animal that can best characterize and describe the way that someone should invest is the humble sloth, okay? And uh, that's really something that I'm really, really so passionate about. And when we think about, for example, we think about the bull and the bear and that kind of dichotomy between the two, I think the sloth is for me the best compound creation to describe how one should invest. And over the coming weeks, I'm really looking to dive a little bit deeper into my five bedrock principles, okay? The first being simplicity, which I know we're going to touch upon this week, low fees, owning the world, time, and headstrong, okay? Any observant amongst you will recognize the fact that, uh, yeah, that spells out sloth, okay? S-L-O-T-H. So that gives me just, that gives you just a little bit of insight there into why I believe the sloth is the best animal to describe investing. Now, I'm, I'm one of those people who I started investing later in my life. I probably didn't appreciate the importance and for my own financial well-being and financial security, I started later in life and I didn't have that financial literacy when I was younger. Now, I'm older and I'm a lot more knowledgeable and I've tried to pass this on to my own, my own children about the importance of being financially literate. Why do you think it is that a, a, actually a significant amount of people in, who are working, they actually don't invest their money? Yeah, that's a great question, Jay. I just think there are so many misconceptions out there. I really do. Um, we think about investing. And yeah, of course, investing primarily is centered upon numbers. We hear all of these numbers such as PE ratio, forward PE ratio, earnings, and so on. And people pick up on that. Uh, but one way in which I think that works to investing to inv- to people's disadvantage is the fact that people see it as a numbers game. And people think, well, I'm not good at maths and I can't invest and investing isn't for me. It's just, they mark it in a box marked as, you know, too difficult. You know, it's just not something I can do. It's for other people. Um, some people really believe that they're going to be out of their depth. 
you know, I've never invested before. It's not something perhaps that even someone in my family has done before. So they mark it in that box as too difficult, okay? Place in the box that's too difficult. Um, for me personally, no one in my family had ever invested before. Um, it's not something that has ever really been spoken to me about with regards to family members. So there's no prior history. And I think that is commonly the case for many other people as well. If they've had no one in their family that's ever invested, I think that's also another impediment as well. Um, I'd also state as well, I know this is much talked about as well, investing circles, but the media, many people are put off investing because of the kind of hyperbole and sensationalism that is very much a current in, in the media. We think about CNBC and we, we think about kind of the headlines we get when there has been a correction or even a crash, we get these kind of danger signs, the bright lights, neon lights flashing. I mean, thinking back to my early years in the UK where I grew up, whenever I did hear about investing in the media, it was commonly when there had been a big drop and maybe a you know, major financial crash. And what happens, we get those scenes from the New York Stock Exchange, traders frantically scurrying around the trading floor, beads of sweat trickling down their head, the heartbeat being raised. Screaming and, and shouting on the, the trading floor. Absolutely, Jay, you know what I'm talking about. And you can just see how that would naturally put people off investing. I know it, it certainly has put many of my friends and family members off. And my final point, just to kind of keep things a bit more concise here, but my final point is just, I really feel that within educational circles, there's just a lack of emphasis given to investing. And it's a real shame. Um, I don't know what form this could take place, whether some pop-up workshops or maybe within citizenship or maybe even more within mathematics lessons, you know, have a focus upon compound interest. But I really do believe that such a lack of emphasis upon investing in education is such a shame. And I will give a shout out at this stage. I'm sure it's something we'll touch upon in future podcasts, but I'll give a big shout out to Andrew Hallam. Um, for those of you who are unaware, Andrew Hallam is the author of The Millionaire Teacher. And I used to live in the Middle East and Andrew would frequently visit the Middle East and give investing workshops, not only to expats, be they British, Canadian, Australian, uh, American, he would also commonly pop into schools, particularly international schools, and speak to secondary students about investing, wise investing principles, how he learned to invest. So for me, there's just a brief rundown about why I thought so many people don't invest. You know, and actually, it's, it's funny because I was talking to some teachers today just before you came in about sort of my investment experience. And I'm, I'm admittedly, I'm a, I'm a noob when it comes to investing. And I've made some serious mistakes, such as going through a broker that wanted me to invest my money offshore. And Andrew, Andrew's work was instrumental in getting me out of that cycle. And I think probably previously, everything you touched upon, I stayed away from it. And I put my money and my trust into a broker because I found it too overwhelming. And one of the things that Andrew pointed out, actually, it, it doesn't need to be this big, overwhelming, constantly on your mind um, strategy that you're using. Andrew did a great job of breaking it down for me. And I know that you actually have come across, or you've developed five bedrock principles uh, through your experience in the 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 time that you've been investing, you've been able to develop what I feel to be very easy strategies and you've, you've summarized them quite succinctly in five bedrock principles. Can you tell me a little bit more what your inspiration was for those five bedrock principles? Yeah, it's um, like I briefly mentioned earlier, it really is a compound creation of what I've learned about investing. So gosh, I've read such a variety of different books now, books by Andrew Hallam, of course, we've spoken about um, great investment writers online, particularly on Twitter, such as Morgan Housel, going back to a real index fund stalwart, such as John C. Bogle. I'm a major advocate of The Motley Fool and all that they have to say about investing as well. Tom and David Gardner are investing luminaries, in my opinion. So podcasts, videos, and I'm going to go back to something that Morgan Housel said. I'm actually going to steal this. So um, if there's any Morgan, Morgan Housel fans out there, you'll notice that T's mentioned this as well. But I just want to give a quote really from someone called John Reed, who wrote a book several years ago called Succeeding. And I'm going to begin quote now. So when you first start to study a field, it seems like you have to memorize a zillion things. You don't. What you need is to identify the core principles that govern the field. The million things you thought you had to memorize 
as simply various combinations of the core principles. So this essentially explains how I created the five bedrock principles of the Sloth Investor because there's beauty in simplicity. Okay, it, it can be so easy for us to think about investing in it, you know, in terms of being a complex domain. And we think about Malcolm Gladwell, for those of you who are familiar with Malcolm Gladwell and his book that he released several years ago, Outliers, he talks about this kind of famous concept, this key concept now of 10,000 hours. So when we think about the Beatles in Hamburg and all of the hours that they accumulated, we think about piano players, we think about perfectly, you know, perfecting a golf swing, okay? All of those different domains and areas in which we require such a, a large accumulation of hours, investing doesn't need to be like that, okay? Investing, we can define investing as as being based upon simplicity, essentially. And I, I wanna go back to what you said, Jay, about low fees. I know that's something we're gonna touch upon in future episodes, but I really think it's important for people to recognize that you don't have to pay someone high fees to invest. It's not necessarily okay. One of the great things about investing in 2021 is that there are so many options available to us based upon low fee, low free brokerages. It's become more and more apparent in recent years that this is the case, that movement to kind of lower fees. Um, so for me, just reading and accessing, listening to so many different sources has enabled me to kind of form those five bedrock principles, simplicity, low fees, owning the world, being globally diversified, time in the market and, and being headstrong. So people might commonly use the word temperament. Okay. And I'd have no uh, disagreement with that either, but I really like the idea of being headstrong because it can be so tempting during times of market volatility or when people are really telling you what to do, whether to sell, whether to buy more, but it's so important to be able to tune out the noise. And of course, that's why I'm quite lucky, you know, being the sloth investor, sloths are half deaf and half blind. So because I'm half deaf, I'm able to kind of tune out the noise when it does occur. So, um, so yeah, the five bedrock principles are, are, are key. And I know that each week we're going to kind of focus upon one of those bedrock principles at a time, okay, that gives an insight into the Sloth Investor, my compound creation for investing. So your first bedrock principle, the S in Sloth, is simplicity. Mm. Can you tell me a little bit more how, what that looks like? What does simplicity look like for the investor? Mm. So for me, simplicity is inactivity. Okay, so if you were to turn on CNBC or if you were to speak to a friend at water cooler, if you were to read kind of financial news, you might be compelled to kind of buy the next hot stock or you might be compelled to kind of sell because that's what, you know, you're being told to do on CNBC. So this stock is not going to do well for the next three months. Its earnings wasn't good. Well, for me, inactivity beats activity. So I really fundamentally believe that 0.01% of investment success is based upon buying and selling, whereas 99.99% of investment success is related to simply waiting, i.e. doing nothing. Okay, I'm gonna kind of go back to that Malcolm Gladwell reference I made earlier, but we think about so many endeavors in life, you know, how do we become a better golf player? How do we perfect that serve in tennis? How do we become a more expert guitar player. Whoa, it's committing time, time, activity, activity, activity. But for me, when it comes to investing, what's so fascinating about investing to me is it's the inverse. It's about simply doing nothing. I'm gonna bring up a fascinating study that I read about several years ago. Um, Fidelity were looking into um, the most successful kind of results that were kind of achieved by some of their investors. Okay, I, in a future episode, I can talk more about this with, them, with more details. But what they found was that actually some of the most in successful kind of results were achieved by people that had simply forgotten about their portfolio. Okay, it's people that had actually, I think even some of the people involved in the results had people, it was actually people that had passed away. So for me, that just proves that inactivity is just so key to the idea of simplicity. Um, i got to make a bit of a movie reference here, a bit of a, the sloth likes to watch movies in his spare time. And I was watching Heat recently, great Michael Mann film from around about 1995. With El Pacino? Al Pacino, you're right. Mr. Husky, I'm impressed. Uh, yeah, El Pacino, wait, and Robert De Niro. You're right. I love it. Robert De Niro and Al Pacino. And uh, Tom Sizemore is in the movie as well, an actor. And he, uh, his character is Michael. And he mentions this, uh, this, this quote he makes. So he, he's one of his dialogue, 
he ma- he's ba- basically says, for me, the action is the juice. Okay, so I'm going to say again, for me, the action is the juice. Okay, so these are some words uttered by Tom Sizemore's character, Michael. And when I think about this, I immediately make a connection to trading. Okay, I think about all, many of people that trade, it's a bit of a high for them maybe. They get such a high and such an adrenaline kick from trading, moving in and out of various positions and so on. Okay, but this is the polar opposite of what the Sloth investor recommends. I really, really fundamentally believe that whether you're buying an index fund or you're investing in a company that Motley Fool has recommended or someone else that you've kind of done your due diligence on, it's really important to have that firm conviction and not to be swung by the kind of noise in the market, and what you might hear in CNBC. So if anything, the juice for the slope investor and other investors like me is lethargy, okay? So I'm gonna mention a Buffett quote here that was a key inspiration for the slope investor. It's from his 1990 shareholder letter. And it's this, uh, lethargy bordering on sloth is the cornerstone of our investment philosophy. And that for me encapsulates so much of what the sloth investor believes in. So uh, simplicity is key. It's my first bedrock principle and it's one of my key bedrock principles, that's for sure. Interestingly, you know what? I was just looking at my portfolio today and I was looking at, there's a temptation I think for, for noob investors, particularly like people like myself to either number one, go chasing stocks or when a stock goes down to think I need to get rid of this as fast as possible. And I'm glad that I've adopted your your simplicity philosophy for my own practice and for my own portfolio because I've, I I own uh, a, a Chinese stock called Meituan, and Meituan has seen the best and worst of days in the last several of months. It's gone anywhere up from uh, jumping up to three times of what I bought it to being up to uh, about eighty percent of where I bought it, and on its way back on its way down. And then the last couple of months, I thought I need to get rid of this as fast as possible. And then it's that reassuring simplicity, calm yourself mm-hmm. down and do nothing. Yeah. Let it sit Buy a company that you trust, that you believe in, and you think over the long term is going to do well for you. And sure enough, it's bounced back. And I think that th- what helps get me through moments of that sort of the, those periods of panic or those periods of trying to chase stocks is the, is the, is the idea of being simple. Simplify your, your portfolio or your, uh, your movements with your portfolio. Yeah, absolutely, Jay. Again, it's that simplicity. Simplicity is key when it comes to investing. And I'm going to go back to Morgan Housel again. You can see that I'm quite a fan of Mr. Housel. Um, he uses this phrase, volatility is the price of entry. And it's a great phrase because if we think about investing, you know, if a stock went up all the time, okay, if, if a stock constantly move in an upward positive direction or if the stock market in general as a whole as a conglomeration of different equities always moved up then you know everyone would invest and it would be the easiest thing in the world to do but the fact that we have to be headstrong we have to have that temperament in order to be able to overcome that volatility it is it's crucial that we do that and um, going back to what you were saying about Metuan it's it's really important to have that firm conviction in the stocks that you own so you've done your due diligence you can see that there's healthy sp- prospects for the company going forward. That's really key to building that conviction and building the ability to be headstrong and have that temperament. And I go back to Jeff Bezos, for example, I've been reading recently some of his shareholder letters from the early 2000s. And I actually think it was Ivy's 2000 or 2001 letter where I think his very first word was ouch, ouch. And that was simply based upon the fact that the previous year, I think Amazon stock had declined by around about 80%. Now you can imagine for Amazon investors, there would have been all sorts of thoughts going in to their mind. We've got to get out of the stock. Like what's going on? We see stocks all around us dipping and declining and this is not this is not good. But, you know, high praise to those Amazon shareholders that remained invested, that didn't kind of succumb to kind of that, that groupthink mentality that can definitely be a key factor in the, in the environment. The so, panic and the fear? Absolutely, Jay. The panic and the fear, you know, they didn't succumb. They simply stayed invested remain the course stay invested inactivity is the order of the day during times like that so i think it's so critical to have faith to have firm conviction in the companies that you own and simplicity is the order of the day that's for sure well that's great um is there 
you know, I, I hate to do this, but can I pass on one more example about how simplicity yeah. has been, I've been able to pass this, actually this bedrock principle onto my son, Jacob. Uh -huh. He has a Canadian e uh, ETF called HXCN. And when he first bought it, and he's investing his own money, when he first bought it, it had gone into the red and it was sitting in the red for about two or three months. And he was being a very, Im or very novice investor himself. Um, as he's going along this journey and learning financial literacy, he was starting to get worried that his money was now worth less. And he was asking me, should we sell it? I need to get some money back out of this. And it's, the, it's that coming back to this, doing, if you believe in it, what you bought, then don't be afraid to sit on it and do nothing. And sure enough, now he's back in black and he's doing quite well now with the, the stock that he's bought. And I'm, it's a good valuable lesson, I think, for him to go through and to see that if you follow this policy and, and sorry, the, follow this sort of the principle that you can actually do be quite successful in your invest with your investments if you're if you're able to keep things simple. That's that's so key. That's so key. And going back to what you were talking about with Jacob as well. I mean, for me, when I think about simplicity and what it means to be a successful investor, I want to touch base upon something that I mentioned earlier when I was talking kind of almost like. Something like imposter syndrome, you know, I think the imposter syndrome puts so many people off investing, it deters them. And something I mentioned earlier was the fact that many people see investing as a numbers game. They think, I'm not good at maps, wasn't my strongest subject at school, so yeah, I'm gonna mark it in a box known as difficult, it's not for me, not for me. But for me, not so much maths or economics, but for me, psychology and history, they are two key subjects that really flesh out so much of what it means to be a successful investor. Yes, I've touched upon psychology a little bit already, and I know we'll definitely dive into psychology a lot more when we look at um, the importance of being headstrong in a future episode. But history, you know, it's just so important to kind of be able to look in a rear view mirror and take a look at what has happened, not only at individual stocks, but a broader stock market as a whole. Okay, so when I have spoken to friends in the past as well, you know, invariably it's often the case that some people don't want to invest in individual stocks and they may not want to kind of commit that time and research to doing so, and that's fine. So one key thing that you and I know, and we've, we've spoken a lot about before is the importance of investing in index funds. So I've got you know, a close friend that I saw in Taiwan around about two years ago. And um, this is someone who's in the late forties, has never invested before, and kind of just wanted to ask me about investing. And um, I spoke about various options. And for me, having spoken to this person for a while, good friend, it seemed that investing in index funds is the key way to go. And that's a great way. If someone doesn't want to commit too much time and effort into investing, wants to really focus upon simplicity, then investing in a broad-based index fund is a great option. We think back to, you know, a god, one of the godfathers investing, you know, alongside Warren Buffett, but John C. Bogle, otherwise known as Jack Bogle, you know, his famous quote was, um, you know, why look for the needle in the haystack? Just buy the haystack, I'm paraphrasing there, but essentially that's what the, the quote was, you know, buy the haystack, don't look for the needle in the haystack, buy the haystack. And I, I just love that quote. I always come back to it when I speak about kind of investing to novice investors, people have no very, who have very little knowledge about investing, I always use that quote because it really encapsulates for me the beauty of investing in index funds. Now, actually, the more you talk, then the more I can make a connection with Andrew Hellam, you know, a, a, a great Canadian, uh, somebody who I um, have read a lot of his work and listened to a lot of his podcasts and a lot of his uh, webcasts on YouTube. And he has a strategy called couch potato investment. And what that is, is it's exactly what sort of the simplicity is. Um, the simplicity principle is that don't, you don't have to think about it. You don't have to try and guess or time the market. You just, on a regular schedule, don't think, just park your investment in an ETF or an index fund and sit back and hopefully watch it grow over the next 5, 10, 20 years. Absolutely. And again, Andrew Hallam is uh, someone I admire incredibly. He's been a godsend for kind of, I know, expatriate teachers who've learned so much from him. Because Myself I, included. Yeah, absolutely. I know it's it's quite difficult if you're working away from your home country and uh, you're not able to invest so easy because you're in a different country, whether it's the Middle East or Asia, wherever you might be. Then Andrew Hallam and his work, his podcasts, his books, he writes regularly online. I think it's for Asset Builder. Am I right, Jay? Is it Asset Builder? He writes one, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, asset yeah, builders, asset, yes. Uh, yeah. So Andrew Hamm's been a godsend. And what's fascinating as well is you can just see 
how many people have written about their approach to investing, whether it's Andrew Hallam and a millionaire teacher. JL Collins is also someone a tremendous, I'm a tremendous fan of. He wrote a book called A Simple Path to Wealth. And also, guys, you're going to have to forgive me, but um, The Coffee Shop Investor, the author's name escapes me right now, but it's another great book, okay? And all of those books, okay, advocate that kind of simple approach to investing. If I touch upon JL Collins a little bit more here, The Simple Path to Wealth, um, Maybe he, some of your fans on Twitter, if you if you can remember the the author of the, the coffee shop investor, the coffee yeah. shop investor, you can um, tweet it to us. Yeah, please. please do. Please tweet me to stuff investor that one. I need to double check that one. But JL Collins, he's someone who actually lived through the um, financial crash of the late eighties, and in his book, in the Simple Path to Wealth, he talks a lot about ah, kind of the torment and the anguish that he went through. What should he do? Should he hold on and so on? And he ultimately ended up selling so much of his his um, equity portfolio and of course he reflects upon in a book a little bit later about how that, that was a mistake and that was a learning experience for him as an investor and um, another fascinating thing about JL Collins is the fact that he was invited by Google believe it or not I think it was around about the early 2000s when Google was really really starting to pick up momentum and ahead of steam and the executives at Google realized that wow okay we're going to kind of um, incubate and produce so many potential millionaires at our company. There's going to be so many people that benefit from us here at Google. But at the same time, we realize that many of our employees could fall prey to kind of those sharks that invariably circulate the financial kind of industry. Okay. And they didn't want that to happen. Okay. So top marks to Google for that. And they actually invited JL Collins in to speak to uh, the employees at Google about that. So uh, yeah, so J.O. Collins is one of my kind of key luminaries alongside Morgan Housel and Warren Buffett, Andrew Hallam, uh, Jack Bogle, I don't know if I mentioned already, but so many people that you can learn from. And just uh, to kind of wrap things up in that respect, one of my favorite quotes is actually by Isaac Newton, who was an utterly lousy investor. And perhaps I'll touch more upon that in future um, podcasts, but in this quote from a Newton, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants. And this is something that I think we all as investors can do. We can learn from these kind of figures, these giant figures in the world of investing, whether it's Bogle or Buffett or Morgan House or Andrew Hallam. Not saying you have to do exactly what they do, but kind of you can like synthesize elements of these different kind of luminaries, whether it's the Gardner Brothers from the Motley Fool, Buffett, Bogle, like I mentioned. But I think it's really important kind of like pick out key elements of different investors and kind of add it to your own repertoire, your own philosophy on investing. Maybe if you're listening to this podcast on Twitter, you can, we invite you to, to tweet in, give us an example of how you've used simplicity in your portfolio. And there's been times where I haven't used simplicity and I long lived to regret it, but there was times that I've used simplicity and to the benefit of my portfolio. If you're listening to this on Twitter and how can people follow you on Twitter? Yeah. So I've been active on Twitter now since March. It's really taken off. I just, uh, I've been really, really um, delighted to join a Twitter community. Your, follow, your, your followers are getting up there at a fast rate. I was actually impressed. Thanks, Jay. I'm at about uh, three and a half thousand at the moment. And it's, uh, you can follow me on Twitter and it's um, at Sloth underscore investor. So again, it's at Sloth underscore investor. And um, yeah, some some things I regularly do to uh, kind of uh, contribute to the community, something that my followers have started to enjoy. So on a Sunday, there's something that I do called the Sloth Sunday Supplement, where I kind of, I will summarize and synthesize some key ideas from an invest in text, whether this is a book or a shareholder letter. And then there's, um, there's something that's become very, very popular within the uh, FinTwit community. It's called the Slothy Trophy. A little bit more on this. So what I'll do is, uh, the week before, I'll kind of trawl my way through FinTweet, looking for what I deem to be tweets that really adhere to and match to my bedrock principles, okay? I think I'm on around about week eight or week nine now, but uh, the Slophy Trophy, each week I award the Slophy Trophy to another member of the FinTweet community. So it might be a tweet that really, really, okay, matches to what I talk about with regards to low fees, or someone might mention something with regards to kind of uh, being headstrong, Okay, and uh, that's something that's been going really well as well. So, um, yeah, do make sure you follow. And um, something that I'm looking to introduce as well, actually beginning tomorrow, I'm actually every two weeks going to be uh, introducing a, a kind of deep dive into a company. Okay, that's not a company where I'm saying you must buy this company. It's a full recommendation, but it's a company that you can add to in terms of your, your kind of portfolio 
peaks if you like so if you're if you're particularly peaked by companies in a particular industry and you want to kind of delve a bit deeper and um, use that as kind of like a catalyst for research and please do but um a recommendation for something to keep an eye on exactly a recommendation for someone to keep an eye on okay for you to for you to look at and for you to delve deeper into okay for you to kind of commit more due diligence towards yeah. that's great and so people that they want to follow you uh sloth underscore investor and you know what what i what i love about your um your you being on twitter is that i see people write into you ask you questions and you actually take the time to reply mm. so if anybody has a question tweet you yeah. sloth underscore investor and i pretty much guarantee you're going to reply yeah. thanks Jay. i think that's really important okay we think about the slope bringing it back to the slope as well what are slopes like Slopes are pretty humble creatures, okay? We think back to one of our dear, one of my dear favorite animated creations in the Disney movie. We think about Flash from Zootopia. Have you seen Zootopia, Jay? <laughs> I did, and I love the, I love the scene at the, oh. the license bureau. It's fantastic, isn't it? It's fantastic. And, you know, dear old Flash, he's a pretty humble guy, isn't he? He really is a humble guy. And, you know, I bring it back to the fact that, you know, being such a humble guy, I can imagine Flash, no matter how slow he moves, he would take the time to respond to everyone's query, okay? And um, that's what I, the Slope Investor, um, try to do as well. It's funny, actually, we mentioned uh, Flash, actually, because a few people on Fintwit have actually mentioned, you know, how was it that the Slope Investor was able to grab their attention? And and they mentioned Flash, flashing, you know, using using Flash in my responses. That's a, That was a way in which I was able to grow my kind of follower base using Flash's picture as a way to kind of capture attention. So, uh, yeah, Flash is one of my dear favorite animated uh, characters, that's for sure. All right, guys. Well, that thanks everyone for tuning in. That was fantastic. I know I learned a whole lot here. Um, and again, it doesn't need to be difficult. It, it What pushes a lot of people away is the fact that people are afraid that they, they're going to get overwhelmed. They don't understand it. And it doesn't need to be that way. Absolutely, Jay. I mean, just to reiterate, simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. I'm going to say it three times, but it really is so key. Okay. Don't let the financial media or don't let a fixation number stop you. Have that inherent belief in simplicity. Okay. Maybe dive a bit deep in some of the, the uh, books I've mentioned. Follow people such as Morgan House or there's several more that we're going to mention in future podcasts. But yes, yeah, simplicity is so key. And um, I'm looking forward to, in future podcast episodes, diving more into those additional bedrock principles, which are low fees, owning the world, time, and headstrong. All right. We'll see everybody in our next episode. So long, guys. Keep investing. Keep it simple. For more tips, follow the Sloth Investor on Twitter at Sloth underscore Investor.